Redskins Training Camp Weekly live with USA Today, SMG Insider, and Redskins writer, Dujanae Bland. I got that right this time. I want to make sure I get it right. Yeah, you got it right this time. All right, bet, bet. All right, Dujanae, last week we had some great talk about the, the first week of training camp. This week, another week's in the books. I didn't see any uh, injury news or anything going on, just, you know, some bumps and bruises, nothing major. Did uh, anything come across the injury wire uh, this week that you saw the coach your eye? Uh, no, I know there was some fake talk about Dotson having his uh, heel drained or some crap. That's garbage. It's not true. Never happened. Um, other than that, like you said, just bumps and bruises. And, uh, you know, those bumps and bruises are going to come when, uh, when guys are physical out there on the practice field. And uh, I'd rather, have, you know, you'd rather have the bumps and bruises and, and guys getting callous now uh, instead of going out there and, uh, you know, blowing an ACL, blowing a knee, um, you know, blowing a calf, pulling, a, pulling this, pulling that, uh, tearing this, tearing that in in season because uh, guys have basically been in bubble wrap uh, all training camp and all preseason. No doubt. Yeah, I did see that uh, rumor come out and uh, it was quickly dispelled. But, you know, we spoke about the D.C. sports media. When there's no drama, they have to create drama. And that's what we don't do here. So they have, it's been a quiet camp. There's been no quarterback controversy. You know, players are getting getting healthy. You know, they're out there just taking care of business. And they have to find something to talk about to make themselves look like they're an insider or they got a scoop. So, yeah, that's neither here nor there. So what uh, what did you see this week from uh, these guys in camp? Last week we spoke about the, the defense having, you know, the edge, you know, normally early in camp with them, you know, getting getting at the offense. Uh, what did you see this week from the offensive line uh, with some more days of camp under their belt going against this defensive line? Uh, guys are starting to get it together. Uh, Paul Richardson is starting to make a, a resurgence uh, as, um, you know, Alex is, is testing it downfield. Um, of course, guys looks like the real deal out there. Uh, the, the real plus of this is guys like Rob Kelly, um, Tamaje, um, Kari Bibbs, who will probably be part, either start or be part of that that starting rotation early on Thursday. Um, he, he looked good. There's a huge competition uh, at, at running back. Um, but the offensive line is coming together. I know, um, and, and uh, <laughs> I give it to this morning because the, uh, you know, the, the depth chart, first the depth chart has come out. And uh, my, my boy and brother from another mother, uh, Derek Gray, gives me a, a text. Uh, fussing about Sean LaValle being in the starting lineup. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, like I said, we've talked about this before. Um, I think guys, they have guys on this roster that are very well capable of knocking him off that pedestal, of uh, being the first uh, team guy. The fact of the matter is he's the one who has the experience in this offense. Um, you know, and when he is healthy, he is serviceable. Uh, it also helps when you have guys like Trent, um, you have, uh, you know, Chase Rue, you have the Sheriff, um, Moses, you have uh, a solid offensive line. Um, and, and fortunately enough, they do have some guys that are talented as backups and versatile as well. Uh, so his deficiencies won't be nearly as exposed as they, as they would be if they didn't have talent around him. With that being said, though, uh, this is all about competition, and we'll see how it all pans out uh, when he's out there. Um, but uh, I think there are plenty of guys that can play guard uh, and can take that job from him, uh, Kalis being one of those guys. Uh, but I wouldn't freak out, uh, you know, calm down, woo a little bit. And it's just, it's just the first uh, of many depth charts before preseason. Um, it means absolutely nothing. Uh, we haven't even played the first preseason game yet, uh, so this this thing's going to change several times over. Um, it, it, that means absolutely nothing this early. 
uh, in, in uh, the preseason and training camp uh, of, of things. So, but uh, yeah, I, I think you have to be excited about the offensive line. Trent uh, is healthy. Um, he's feeling good. Uh, they're they're doing. Everybody is on the same page with guys who are injured. We talked about that. Uh, you know, the last time about guys being on. You know, the staff and the player being on the same page and an understanding. Of, of how they're going to roll them back in and what they expect. Um, so, as you said, no storylines, it's business. It's, it's all business, and I think uh, fans should be super excited about that. And, you know, as Alex Smith would say, it's all about ball right now. <laughs> and that's what it should always be about in training camp. Nothing else, no distractions, no, no uh, sideline uh, anonymous sources or whatever you want to call it. But it's definitely good to see you. I actually shared the post on my page. I didn't look at the depth chart, and I'm glad I didn't because I probably would have been one of those folks that have flipped out seeing Sean Lyle's name on the first team. So I'm glad you said that before I even clicked on it. Uh, thanks, Robbie. Appreciate you chiming in. Appreciate you sharing the post, man. Thanks a lot. Erica, what's going on, baby? Glad you're chiming in as always. Uh, let's get back to uh, this team. You mentioned Alex Smith. You know, they were mentioning some of his uh, – getting in sync with Josh, Josh Dox, and they say he's been having a good camp despite the injury rumors or whatever. They say the uh, crowd has been looking pretty good as his uh, time has started to develop with these wide receivers and some of these drills and uh, getting ready for the first preseason game against the Patriots. Oh, yeah, man. I, you know, Josh has been, been exceptionally well um, in catching the ball. Uh, to make himself uh, available. Um, 
learning from guys like Vernon Davis, who, again, we talk about all the time, have, have uh, found the fountain of youth. Uh, those three guys are, are looking really good. If you have all three of them, uh, it's going to be uh, a really, really interesting season to see what Jay does, uh, especially with a quarterback that understands the West Coast offense like Alex, uh, who can make different changes and will be allowed to make changes at the line of scrimmage. Uh, and change protection calls, play calls, et cetera, according to what he sees. Uh, this is going to be very interesting, and uh, it's going to be even better if these three guys can consistently block in the one game and spring uh, those those backs that they have in Guy Thompson uh, and, and, and P. Ryan, et cetera. Oh, no, appreciate that. Uh, what's up, my cousin, my uh Chiming in, he's saying that, uh, talking about Crowder, saying he's no Jackson. You're right. He'll go across the middle and won't be scared. He can still run deep routes, and he can hit the slot <clears throat> and make people look foolish just like d could. And he will run block. So you're right. He's no Jackson. And uh, Eric, <laughs> he had to throw a little pot shot at Kurt. Maybe he heard it in Minnesota when he was talking about Alex saying because the old QB couldn't get him the ball, I guess, with his noodle arm or whatever. But Eric's trying to say, but you had a very valid point about Kurt would not lead the receivers. That is very key, and Alex Smith is very good at doing that, and that's how you get the yak yards. You get those game-breaking plays by letting these athletes, these dynamic game changers, get them in open space and let them make somebody look foolish. Excuse me, you mentioned crowd. I was watching some film from last year when they scrimmaged against the Texans, and that double move he used on Joseph and left Joseph on the ground. So as you mentioned, is going to be key, his chemistry with the uh, wide receiving core. And you alluded to Jordan Reed. I was definitely going to uh, say, uh, mention that, that I did see that he was healthy and, you know, active. So hopefully, you know, he's changed up some of his stuff to hopefully keep him more durable during the season so he can be on the field. And that's talking about him performing instead of what could have, would have, should have. Uh, Eric, I wanted to know, is Crowder back in the slot? Uh, I know we spoke about that with Diane. She said that it's going to be a toss-up between him and Richardson. Have uh, you seen anything, any developments in the past week of where do you think the slot guy is going to be? Is it going to be Paul or is it going to be Crowder? Because Paul Richardson does have some uh, outside experience also. So what do you think is going to uh, pan out with the uh, slot position, Duvernay? I think Crowder will be called. Uh, I think he'll be the slot guy. But I really honestly expect Jay to uh, mix that a little bit. Uh, being that Paul Richardson has experience in the slot, um, and they both are very shifty guys who run Chris routes but sell those double moves. They, they stick their foot in the ground, uh, making those sharp cuts, uh, precise uh, route running as far as ins and outs. I don't think that you're going to with this offense and what Jay likes to do, I think it will be the defense and what they want to take advantage of that will dictate who does what on any given game. On roster and on paper, sure, I think Jameson is going to be that that slot guy um, unless for some strange reason we have a, a either a setback or Dawson doesn't look the part in games at the number two, because Crowder can definitely play number two um, and be the number two guy as well. He can play any guy. I feel like he can be in any position on this field, especially with the type of offense that Jay runs. So, um, yes, I think Jameson is the slot, but I don't think that, that it's going to be uh, one of those things where it's set in stone. There's going to be combinations that Jay's going to throw out there where you're going to find you're going to find a Paul Richardson in the slot. Um, you're, you're going to find Jamison at the one or at the two. Uh, they may put a Dachshund at the slot. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of versatility uh, with this team, uh, especially uh, wide, between the wide receiver and tight end because all of those guys are able to move. They can be put out uh, as wide receivers as well. They don't have to line up at the tight end position only. So um, I just think it's going to be a mixture of combination of things. Um, and that's good because uh, the more you can throw at a team, the less predictable you can be. Uh, and it doesn't matter what they have on tape from last week. You can throw something different.
staring out there at them that they have never seen uh, because of your versatility at the wide receiver and tight end position. And you have a quarterback that can uh, handle that. Very true. And also a quarterback that knows how to break the pocket when it's time to break the pocket instead of taking a bad sack or throwing a bad interception. And uh, Mark, yeah, d Jax is faster than uh, Crowder, but like I said, Crowder is a more complete player. He a block for his running back. He can play inside or outside, and he will go across the middle. d Jax, yes, game changer. He has, you know, 60-yard touchdowns, yada, 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 yada. But we saw, we've saw, we seen the product on the field. We know he can take the top off the defense, but how often does that happen, especially if you're not getting the ball because the defense knows what you're doing every time? So I hope Jay does mix it up because that's definitely what he needs to do because I know I've said it here on many Sundays and called the plays before he's called them, and I've been right about 90% of the time. So hopefully he does mix that up. And speaking of that, a perfect segue into the defense because I know there's going to be a lot of mixing up on the defense. We spoke about the hybrid players, the safeties, the linebackers, they are interchangeable. So uh, what have you seen from the front seven this week with uh, guys getting back healthy? Have you seen any uh, – improvement or any changes, especially at the depth of the inside linebacker, which we talked about? I like Mason Foster, man. Uh, the guy comes in, he's, he's earned that spot and making the calls on the defense. Uh, he's very confident in what you know, what he, uh, his abilities are and what he's able to do. And the team believes in him. Um, all, all, all seven of those guys up front, um, you know, are getting in sync. Uh, you know, I think Mason made a comment of how uh, a guy like Deron Payne uh, eating up those blocks frees them up uh, to be able to make plays um, and not have to take on those big guys uh, initially. And no one's getting to the second level. It, it allows them to do their job and play cleanup. Uh, and and Deron is really clogging up those lanes uh, and allowing them to go to work. And that's important because I, I think Mason Foster's skills go underestimated as a player. Um, not only does he, he make the calls on the defense, he's a solid tackler. Um, he's very rarely out of position. Uh, he's also able to play in coverage. And that combination with uh, him and Zach Brown really showed and paid dividends. Uh, I feel like Preston Smith is, has the potential to turn the corner. Um, and be more consistent of what the flashes that, uh, whether it's, you know, weeks, you know, ends of the season that he's put on or, you know, different games. Uh, he, he has shown the ability uh, to be disruptive and be able to get pressure on the quarterback. I think he's going to uh, be a, a huge game changer uh, and really assist in, uh, making it easier for Ryan Kerrigan to do his thing. Um, you know, who knows? We might have two fish hooks out there uh, between Kerrigan and Preston Smith, and maybe to force these guys to in the in the zebras to have to actually throw a flag uh, because you're going to have two guys get fish hooked out there um, because uh, Preston Smith is is showing his speed and ability and uh, getting around guys. But uh, really, really uh, like what the front seven is doing. They're a disruptive group, but they're a group that can move, um, and they're not uh, flat-footed uh, or concrete feet. Uh, they, they have the ability to be able to move and, and track down guys and fly to the ball, and I think that's what fans want to see, the aggressive front seven, that uh, even if you, you, know, you have a screenplay or, or a guy uh, breaks that first level of the line, that, uh, that the linebacker is going to be a block of guys there to clean that mess up. Uh, and, and get it to, you know, maybe a three-yard, four-yard game and not those seven- and eight-yarders on first down. Yeah, I, I definitely got tired of seeing those. But uh, getting back to the Preston Smith, I was optimistic last year that he would turn the corner. This year is your turn to be optimistic. I'm hoping he does because, like you say, having two quality outside linebackers with the inside depth and the improved uh, D-line, would be very vital to the success of this defense and to this team. And as opposed to the referees calling that when they get hooked, um, Ryan Kerrigan has been getting hooked this whole career, and he's maybe got one call a game, and he got hooked maybe ten times. So I can only hope and pray that they start to pay attention to that. 
I heard they were paying attention to the leading with the helmet in the Hall of Fame game, which I did not watch. I did not want to see Baltimore yeah. versus Chicago. I didn't want to see the Ray Lewis speech. I had it on the TV. It was muted, but he was still irritating, even though I didn't hear what he was saying. So that's neither here nor there. I, I, I'll get into my Ray Lewis. I, I'm, I might even want to get into that rant because that's we're talking Redskins here because I, we're, we're getting some uh, controversial stuff here. But uh, I'm, I'm definitely loving what I hear about the front seven. Uh, what are we talking about the back end? We had question marks about who will be starting uh, on the other side of Josh, uh, who has been getting the majority of the snaps over there, and how's the defensive secondary looked out there? Well, it's been Dunbar, um, and then you got Skandrick also slot in number two, which he, he's a versatile guy, can do both. Uh, I think that's going to be a plus uh, for them. Uh, a guy like Xavier Moreau, um, he, he's been doing fairly well. Um, you have uh, Monte and those guys, they're doing very well. Um, it, I mean, it, again, front half takes care of your back half. And what's so uh, great about it is that Redskins have above average corners. They're, they're above average DBs back there and, and some elite. Uh, I did hear, though, uh, the, I think he, uh, the draft pick, uh, Greg uh, Stroman, not, not, it's not that he's not in position. It's that he's where he needs to be, just not making the play. Um, definitely understands where he needs to be. He's just a little bit behind. Um, so there's a, there's, you know, it's probably a little bit of a learning curve for him. Um, I still think he has uh, the ability to, to be uh, a, a good player yeah, for the Redskins. Um, but uh, he's the only guy that out of that group, um, you know, it's been a little bit of a tough sled uh, for him uh, in, in, that, in that ability to complete plays and finish plays. Um, but and where he's supposed to be, and he's not completely in La La Land and, and, and not understanding uh, his position on the field and, and where he needs to be, you know, uh, according to what the offense dictates. So that that's a good sign. All right. Well, maybe we need to do like we did with uh, like they did with uh, Carlos Rogers and get that LASIK surgery, <laughs> and uh, maybe he can see the ball better and get those uh, completions or whatever. Um, got a question from uh, Jason Harris on the Facebook Live feed. It's an interesting question. That, do you think that uh, the Redskins should trade Preston Smith to the Raiders for Khalil Mack? <laughs> oh man! Um, if if I am the GM, um, and hypothetically, if the, you know. Yeah, that is a possibility. And that's a very good question. And, that, and the thing of it is, it's like this, okay? Preston Smith is in the contract here. So, uh, absolutely. Because who's to say you're going to resign the guy? And to get a guy, a Khalil Mack, I mean, obviously, you don't want to give up too much. But uh, if it's a matter of um, trading two guys, and I believe Preston Smith uh, would fit uh, what Chucky's trying to do uh, and then bring him over and, you know, a reasonable contract, of course, uh, for him uh, with this team, uh, that, that would be perfect. Um, I mean, you would only get better. I mean, to sit here and say that Preston Smith is better than Khalil Mack is a joke. I mean, everybody knows that. Anybody... Anybody who knows anything about football understands that Khalil Mack is a baller. Um, and he's definitely uh, better than Preston Smith. So, sure, I think that would be a pretty good thing. Will it happen? Who knows? I, I, there's no rumblings of that uh, or them looking or whatever or any talk of that. But, uh, yeah, if I was a GM, I definitely would look into it and uh, – give them a call and say, hey, uh, what do you think of this? And see what they they would be willing to uh, work out to get a guy like that, definitely. Yeah, that would be a major uh, major move to get a guy like Khalil Mack. That dude was a monster. I Like I said, heard no rumors of it, didn't see nothing about it, but if it happens, then they, I don't know, they, that'll definitely improve his defense. 
Uh, we got a question from my man, Eric. I really wasn't. We don't really talk too much NCAA unless you're talking NCAA. But uh, he mentioned about the Urban Meyer situation. I'm not really up to speed on it, but uh, I'm going to go ahead and get you. I, I, I saw something about domestic violence that is a rumor that he knew about it going on and did nothing about it. And I saw he was uh, basically suspended or whatever. Uh, you're the NCAA guy, so I get a quick take of what you think since Eric asked about it. You know, I, I steer clear of the NCAA, but uh, what do you uh, have to say about this whole Urban Meyer situation, dude, Nick? It is uh, inexplainable. It is uh, irreprehensible that this guy would know something of this magnitude. Um, and here we are again, because we all know when Irvin was there, uh, Florida kind of led the NCAA in cover-ups and trouble. Uh, it's funny how other Southern schools and SEC schools, their dirt would come out. But we kind of sweep Florida stuff under the rug. And now here we go again. He all of a sudden fakes a heart issue, and then a year later comes and goes back and goes to the Buckeyes, and now you're talking about you don't under, you just, you, you knew something and you didn't do anything about it. And the fact that he's able to keep his, keep his job right now and be paid, although suspended, is another show. Like, I mean, what are we doing here? And if you listen to a guy that I, I kind of uh, admire in that, uh, in that, NCAA realm, Paul Feinbaum, he could probably keep his job. Well, uh, Eric, did, Eric this time didn't say they, they let they let him. They said they let him go today. So that, that I think that's what Eric saying that they let him go today. Well, that's new news to me. Um, it's the right thing to do because in you have to know that the day and age that we live in, and. With all the scandals that have gone on, and some of them have been quite horrific when you look at the Penn State issue, um, you can't have this type of stuff going on. And the objective is to set an example for these college students and to be above that and to be the adult in these situations. If you're harboring people that are not exuberating class and not going about their lives in the way that they should be, um, they do not need to be on your staff. And if you're hiding these folks and you're covering for them, you're basically uh, you're basically saying that that is okay and he deserves to be fired. Um, and I personally feel that he should never coach again. Um, and I don't think I really don't think that that is going to happen either. Um, I think it was the right thing for them to do. It's very unfortunate, but uh, it's unfortunate that someone of his magnitude, uh, who I deem to be a solid coach, um, would allow something of that, of that magnitude to go on and then do nothing about it. There's a thing of winning at all costs, but you know that that's more of a saying. That's not that's not reality. <laughs> that shouldn't be the norm. Like all calls doesn't include things of this magnitude. Um, and at some point, you got to draw the line. Now, with that being said, uh, you know, Urban is one thing, but the NCAA can sit here and point the finger uh, and act like that they are. Um, you know, basically uh, scrub clean of any dirt uh, is laughable because they're just as bad as, as these types of things that we're finding out in these programs going on. Um, and I feel like at times that they deserve to catch a little bit of the heat as well because, once again, uh, if you're doing your due diligence, um, you know, we're ready to stick it to people who, uh, players and, and who are just trying to scrape by to get food um, and, and different things like that. We're not talking about people stealing things and things of that nature, but just getting food. You're making money off of their jersey. Uh, they, you know, they 
can't even sign an autograph or whatever without because you're not getting anything from it. Um, it's it's disgusting, and uh, I've never I've I've been on record many years now with my disgust with the NCAA uh, and, and their really horrific way of, of of going about business and expecting high level of of basically you know integrity from from its its student players and coaches, but yet themselves act like that they can wipe their hands in these types of situations that crop up. Um, if you're doing your due diligence, you're doing your job, these things don't happen. Um, it's not just on the universities, it's, it's on the NCAA as well, because they're the ones that are making the big money along with the coaches. So they are all responsible in this, this, uh, this deal. Uh, so the right thing was done, and uh, hopefully this type of thing doesn't happen again. But uh, as long as the NCAA is focusing on uh, chastising its players and keeping its thumb down on, on the players, the very players that they're making billions of dollars off of, um, this is probably not the last time we hear of scandals such as this or like this uh, in the future. True. Uh, I got a correction. They didn't, I was, uh, we had uh, some. Uh, comments about if Jay Gruden uh, didn't perform in the season, should he be let go? The comment was they let him go now. That was uh, them saying that, uh, uh, a fellow Jay hater saying they should let Jay go now. So officially Urban Meyer has not been let go, but uh, I agree with you with everything you said. It's, it don't even get me started on You know how I feel about the NCAA. The NCAA I was going to say something else, but yeah, you know how I feel about the college rankings and all of that stuff. Also had a question uh, about uh, Crowder. Asking should the uh, should the Redskins re-sign him and extend him uh, with his contract being up soon? Uh, absolutely. Um, you look at his statistics; uh, he's been very consistent. Um, some of his, I say his, he had seven hundred and eighty-nine yards and eighty-four yards last year. I don't attribute that to him. Uh, for him to have the amount of catches and the yards he had uh, with getting off to a slow season start because of the uh, the hammy issue, um, yeah, I mean, you have to have a guy like that, um, and guys like that in the slot who run crisp, precise routes, who sell them very well, uh, who have the ability to uh, shake the opponent, um, and he shakes, at times, shakes his way open, um, and, and he doesn't need, uh, you know, uh, design, play design to scrub a guy off or to, to, to scrub a, a defender off. He can get, he has the ability to get open on his own. You have to keep a guy like that. Um, it's, the, it's the same with, with, with any receiver uh, that has the ability to generate and get open. There's not too many of them out there, um, and a lot of it's done by smoke and mirrors and play design, and kudos to that because – you know, that's what football is all about. It's about design. But when you have a guy that can do that on his own, outside of design, uh, you have to keep him. Um, and I think he'll prove that this year. Uh, he'll prove his worth here this year. And uh, I think he'll do the right thing and keep him. He has been uh, one of the most consistent guys uh, here since he's been brought here, drafted here, um, on, on that wide receiver course. So, absolutely, uh, I think he's a must extent for sure yeah i'm definitely looking for him to take that next step like you mentioned you know the year before you know he had a, a huge uh, step up from his season prior the last year he, like you say he started out slow had the injury issue so i'm hoping that uh this year that he will take that next step and the better he does the better everybody else does because then the secondary has to start worrying about him and then you still got jordan reed and you still got josh and you still got chris out the backfield so as you mentioned with the deception and, you know, making the defense, you know, adjust to the offense instead of the offense adjust to the defense, which is a staple of Jay's offense, unfortunately, if they can change that dynamic, this team will be definitely uh, somebody to reckon with on the offensive side. And if everything continues on the defensive side, like we're hoping, uh, this should be a complete team that will, uh, that will be under the radar and hopefully can make some noise this season. 
uh, before we get out of here, I know we're only going to go 30, but, you know, these great Raiders games talk always end up going longer. Uh, any other uh, overall uh, synopsis or, you know, things of the past week that you've seen uh, look forward to going to next week? Is the first preseason game this Thursday or next Thursday against the Patriots? I lost track of the date. This Thursday. Ah, so it is this Thursday. Thursday. All right, so I guess we'll give a quick preview. We know it's a jump game. It's a preseason. There's going to be a lot of backup players. It's probably not going to make the team. But uh, what will you be looking for in the limited, hopefully at least 20 snaps the offense gets? What would you think Jay will do, and what do you be looking for, you know, out there in those few snaps that the first-team offense is going to get? I just want to see uh, cohesiveness and the uh, look that we look like we know what we're doing. Um, I think Redskins fans uh, many times over the last couple of years have felt, and, and it started, you know, it, it started with Mike Shanahan, uh, you know, as well. But uh, the, the the fact that at times this team looks incompetent in its first preseason game, like, and I understand there's no like really big game plan or anything like that. But you you don't want to look like we just like picked eleven guys on on that were sitting in the playground and said, hey, uh, let's go out here and run a couple plays and we're drawing up routes and crap in the dirt. I mean, it looks it does it looks bad and it, it makes fans concerned. And honestly, to those who say preseason doesn't matter, and I'll be the first to tell you I was one of those guys. Mm-hmm. It does, um, and if you don't, if you don't look like if you don't look the part, they usually don't look the part when the games start counting. That's why they get off the slow start, especially look like atrociously bad in the first game of the year. Um, but uh, I want to see that. Uh, I want to see guys like uh, Trey Quinn, uh, the Troy Abkees, uh, the draft picks, uh, some of, some of the. Uh, some of the guys, the bubble guys, uh, go out and, and make plays. I just want to look and see competence. Uh, it's not about winning, but it's about looking like we understand and know what we're doing out there and understand that uh, they have a plan. Uh, it looks like they have a plan, and guys understand where they're supposed to be and need to be. Uh, I want to see tackling. Um, that has to be, uh, you know, first and foremost as well. I want to see guys tackling, being in position
you're not ready for it. And that's where people's bodies collapse. Um, and can't have that this season. Uh, him being, uh, Jay being in fifth year uh, as head coach, uh, doing the trade for Alex Smith and, and uh, the piece they lost there. Need to show some formality and show that they can win ball games and that they're going to be competent and better than they were last year. And it all starts with uh, getting physical in practice. If you're not physical in practice, you're not physical in training camp, it's very hard to come out in the game and be physical and make tackles if you're not tackling in practice. I mean, it's just common sense. Uh, and that worry is over, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, they're, they are getting after it uh, in practice. Um, last thing I want to talk about really quickly is the new rule of the um, – that it was called a lot in the, the Ravens game, preseason Hall of Fame game. Um, basically, if you are not, if you do not have your head up and you are in any sort of angle and your head is down, it doesn't matter if I'm hitting the person in the chest, in the waist area, if your head is down, the flag will come out. So it's very simple. I know some people may be, uh, feel some type of way about that, but uh, I will break it down for you this way. Um, if your head is down, you cannot make a clean tackle on what you cannot see. That is the first thing. The second thing is, if your head is down and you make a tackle on a moving target coming at you and you collapse your neck, you are likely to be not walking or dead. It's just that simple. Especially with guys as big and as fast as they are coming downhill, making plays. Yes, they are calling it. They are throwing the flag. Uh, and it is very clear. Um, the league sent out emails of the video uh, to show uh, what is acceptable and what is not. I felt it was very clear in the video. Um, and it should be very clear to the players and the fans once they get a feel of what they're going to be calling. But it's very obvious. If you're leaning forward and your head is down, you will be called. Uh, the head must be up at all times in making a tackle. And as long as that head is up, uh, there should not be a flag on that plate. But if that head is down, you even not even just the crown of the helmet anymore. If, if you're hitting with the top of the face mask, above the eyes, any of that, it is, it is absolutely going to be a flag. And it is a 15-yard penalty. So I'm sure, 100% sure, that uh, at least the veteran guys, along with coaches, are working extremely hard to make sure that these young guys are doing that. And that could be probably be a huge factor on whether guys make the team uh, as well because uh, you can't afford 15-yard penalties giving guys, like, free yards uh, in football a chase momentum quick. And uh, a penalty like that could swing – momentum and give an offense life really easily uh, if you're, you're you're not careful. So, um, yeah, very, very self-explanatory, very clear. And, yes, it, it will be a lot of flags in preseason. There were a considerable amount, but the calls were legit uh, in that regard. Most definitely. We know about the uh, emphasis on player safety. Uh, <clears throat> you know, the Keeping a head down, that is, you know, not a good look. But they have been changing, you know, going down to the USA football, to the small kids, they're teaching them how their head's up when they tackle. So hopefully these guys, they've been doing it so long, hopefully they can break the cycle and they can uh, do it and avoid, as you say, the penalties that are swing momentum and injury. So all we can do is hope for the best. Hopefully the refs call the stuff that's on the field. We mentioned the holding and the hooking calls that – I've noticed over years and years of Ryan Kerrigan getting hooked when he gets to the quarterback. But uh, they're trying to clean the game up. All we can do is wait and see what happens, and hopefully do the preseason games. They're able to, you know, get all of that stuff out, and hopefully players learn and start adapting to the new game. Unfortunately, it's changing. And, uh, you know, trying to make it for the better, even though it's going to take away some of the big hits that we're used to. But... It's all about player safety, and that's where we—that's the direction we're headed in. But as always, Dujanae, yeah. we went a little bit longer than we planned, but we had some good questions from the.
uh, Facebook live feed. I appreciate all of y'all tuning in, chiming in with the questions. Make sure y'all come back next week for uh, Redskins Training Camp Weekly, where we'll break down another week of uh, what's going on down in Ashburn. I mean, no, down in Richmond. I'm sorry. And uh, I'll be working on trying to get Diane Cheeseboro back on uh, in the next couple of weeks, maybe after the first preseason game, just to get her thoughts. So stay tuned for that next week also. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and end this feed. Appreciate it as always. And I'll be sharing this on uh, later on when Robbie didn't share it. So, you know, we like to cover all our bases on sports and